Okay, so uh, I was asked to spend about 30 minutes talking about how to implement a central bank digital currency. So here we go. And I hope you like my uh, formulation of this. So first of all, a little bit about me. You don't need to see that. I write various things in various places. I've written some books. My most recent book, 2020 in May, is called thecurrencycoldwar.com, available at all good bookshops and I hope some of the bad ones as well. So please rush out and buy it immediately after this talk. The reason why I think uh, this is a good time to be talking about this, I mean, people have been talking, me included, about central bank digital currencies absolutely for ages, but what's important right now is that there is actually a central bank digital currency, the People's Bank of China. That, uh, that was uh, launched in May, I, I'm very happy that the People's Bank of China decided to launch a marketing campaign for my new book. I'll have to figure out a way to thank them properly for it sometime. There are three points I want to make about the digital currency that was launched, because I, I want to just illustrate the fact that this exists. This isn't theoretical. So just three quick points to make about this. First of all, this is what we call a two-tier system in that the central bank digital currency um, is is handled through commercial banks or other financial institutions. In other words, you don't have a wallet with the with the central bank. You have a wallet with a financial institution, and you load that with central bank digital currency. The second important point is that you can you see where it says I've I've labelled it touch it on the on the screen there. I wonder if I can draw on this. Maybe you can see this if I draw it. So here, so you see there it says touch it. Um, that's that's person to person transfers offline. So in other words, if there is no mobile network, no mobile phone network, no internet, you can still send limited amounts of, of money from one, uh, one phone to another phone, one device to another device. I think that's a really Im interesting design decision. We'll come back to that a bit later on. And thirdly, it's live. This isn't a pilot. This is up and running right now. And just to be completely clear, before people start commenting on it. It's not a cryptocurrency and it's not based on a blockchain. So let's let's make the distinction right at the very beginning. We don't need blockchains and we don't need cryptocurrencies to implement a central bank digital currency. Now that doesn't mean we might want to use them. We might, but we don't need them is the point to make here. Okay, how is that doing? So yesterday at Cybos, which is the big bankers conference, the deputy governor of the People's Bank of China said they've already processed $162 million in transactions. They have 6,700 applications up and they have over 100,000 digital wallets and almost 9,000 corporate wallets. This is their pilot scheme, remember, in four cities. So this is why we're talking about central bank digital currency, not because it's theoretical, but because it's actual, because it's there and it's up and running right now. Okay, now how do we think about digital currency, central bank digital currency? Here is my handy diagram to help people think about this very clearly. And if you go from the top, you can see the way I'm thinking. So the first distinction to make is between money that's held in wallets and money that's held in bank accounts. Money that's held in bank accounts is electronic money. That's almost all the money in the world already. I don't know what the numbers are for Ukraine, but in the UK, something like 97, 98% of all the money in circulation is electronic money already in bank accounts. Only a small amount of it is cash. We're not interested in that for a digital currency because a digital currency has to replace cash, not bank accounts. So therefore, we're interested in money that we store in wallets. Now, who, who runs those wallets? Um, well, interesting decision point. We can have a single operator running it or we can have multiple operators. If a single operator is running it, then that could be a public, the central bank, or it could be a private company that's awarded the contract to run that. So in the UK, for example, that could be Vocalink, which is MasterCard. It could be the clearinghouse in the United States. But I don't think we want something that's run by central. Maybe. I'm not sure. We'll discuss that in the questions and answers. If there are multiple operators, how do you deal with the fundamental problem of double spending? So once, you've, once you don't have a single operator who can see all the transactions, you have this problem about double spending. You'll remember Mark Zuckerberg very famously said he wanted to make sending money around the internet as easy as sending a photo around the internet. But of course, 
sending money around the internet isn't the same as sending a photo around the internet because if i send you a photo i i'm sending you a copy i don't send you my photo when i send you a photo i'm sending you a copy i still have the photo that's good for photos it's not so good for money so we have to figure out how to prevent double spending there are two ways of doing that we can do it in hardware or we can do it in software so in hardware we put the money in tamper resistant chips that's you know a great solution but you have to have the chips obviously to do that alternatively we can do it in software by keeping the transactions in some sort of ledger where do we keep those ledgers well we can keep them in a centralized form databases uh, or we can have them in some sort of decentralized form using some kind of cryptography okay so this is my kind of decision tree the history of electronic money uh, the history of electronic cash and how we might come to implement a digital currency and why i think we might implement it in a particular way so let's let's use some real examples here so this this chart shows you a couple of things so first of all just to talk about examples to make it straightforward if you look at um if you look at the example of a single operator a single private operator running the system a good example of that is mpesa in kenya if you look at the example of hardware we've got the example of mondex from from the uk and elsewhere a few years ago if you look at the example of uh, decentralized uh, then we have you know the opportunity of tokens and i'll come back to that in a minute and if you want to look at the history of electronic cash i, I often think people people particularly in the bitcoin field they don't pay enough attention to the history they think nobody ever tried any of this stuff before but i've put a few examples on here which actually i use in my book so if you want to understand kind of the evolution of electronic cash you can look at these examples and there's two examples there that are particularly important to me because a company that i helped to found consult hyperion was the consultant for two of those projects mpesa and, M and mondex so i've seen population scale electronic cash succeed and i've seen population scale electronic cash fail so i think i have some useful opinions on both things now if you look on the right hand side the european central bank at the end of last month published a report on a digital euro and if you look uh, i've just i've i've let i've um, labeled to show you what they're talking about so when they talk about the architecture of an electronic euro a digital euro in section 6.2.1 they talk about hardware solution like mondex in section 6.2.2 they talk about software solutions and the one that i'm particularly interested in is in their section 6.3 they talk about more advanced techniques whereby cryptographic proof is computed to remain to prove to the central bank that account amounts recorded remain valid so european central bank 6.3 remember that because we'll come back to that a bit later on now if you look at the way i've drawn this diagram bearing in mind what i think uh, a central bank digital currency could do you can see that i've outlined three possibilities so if you look at the if you oh, sorry don't need that one. If you, i've outlined three possibilities of how we could really implement things so these i think are the three realistic ways we could implement central bank digital currency i mean you could look at all of those other possibilities but i don't think they're realistic possibilities for a population scale central bank digital currency so in this presentation i'm just going to talk about those three examples the private operator the hardware solution and something to do with tokens and notice i've put chains off to one side because i want to put chains to one side for this discussion so i think these are the three the three realistic possibilities so let's explore those three realistic options and for the sake of for the sake of marketing purposes i think it's a wrong decision actually but for the sake of marketing purposes i'm going to say the three options that we should look at for central bank digital currency are are fed peza fed dex and fed coin actually it should be called fed token actually i think i need to change that name fed fed token fedcon fedoken i don't know i'll think of something fed coin is the wrong name it should be fed token but anyway it doesn't matter so uh so let's look at these three examples and have a little bit of a think about them so the first example which is mpesa says uh why don't we just use some sort of mobile money system 85 to 90 percent of the population have mobile phones 
um, M-Pesa didn't require smartphones, so it just uses it just uses um, uh, secure SIMs, which actually was a was a very if you read the history of M-Pesa, it was a very brave decision by the operator because it meant reissuing SIMs to all of its users so that the SIMs would have the right cryptography in them for it to all work, and the um, you know the uh, SIM toolkit menu that was a brave decision, but it turned out to be a very successful decision. So, so one one kind of we can label kind of I mean I've called it Fed Peza, but we could label it sort of mobile money kind of thing. And actually, you know, there are reasons for thinking that that could work for a digital currency, for a central bank digital currency. I, you know, maybe there are better options, but certainly for a digital currency, that could work. And you could certainly imagine something like M-Pesa um, that uh, that gets the coverage and people find it easy to use and and blah blah blah. So 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 Fed Pay, I think the mobile money solution. Then we have uh, the hardware solution, which I would call here the cash substitute solution. So a cash substitute solution is something that allows for the person to person, device to device payments this is actually 25 years old this uh, that's a that's a mondex some mondex cards a mondex keyring a mondex wallet those things come from 25 years ago and that enabled people to move money from chip to chip um including some phones actually which aren't included i mean landline phones with no mobile phones then uh, and of course that depends on the hardware remaining secure but actually you know hardware is pretty secure the chips that are used for that are the chips that are used on chip and pin cards they're used for sim cards if those chips weren't secure then all of the banks and all of the mobile operators will be out of business already so if we limit the amount of money you can store in one of those chips to i don't know whatever a thousand dollars or something um that's a viable way of doing it of course you wouldn't do it with smart cards now you you'd use mobile phones but we'll come back to that in a minute and then the third possibility is to use some kind of decentralized solution. I won't go so far as to say blockchain at the moment, but a decentralized solution um, with um, what I call smart money sitting on top of it. And what I mean by smart money is programmable money, or oh, that's what the Bank of England call it. Uh, and that's what I call Fed coin, but I, I think I really should call Fed token. So those are my three those are my three real options for implementing central bank digital currency. And you can see where I'm already leading with this because, because under smart money, I've put the potential for innovation. And I'm gonna come back to that a bit later on. I think that's an important topic. Okay, so uh, option one, why doesn't the central bank just do uh, a Fed PESA? um well they could or they could contract a private company to do it the the problem is getting cash in and out of the system so um in the in the case of mobile money solutions in africa and latin america the mobile operators have big networks of agents that sell airtime and those networks of agents were, were well placed to provide the cash in and cash out points. If we were to do something like this in the UK, uh, we would probably use pay points and we would probably use uh, smaller retailers, perhaps, as the cash in, cash out. There's an experiment about to start in the UK to, to effectively, because all the ATMs are closing and all the bank branches are closing. There's an experiment about to start using small retailers as cash out places for bank networks. And you know, you could imagine expanding that. It has a lot of a lot of issues that need to be resolved because if you're going to use if you're going to use shops or post offices or something as cash out networks, that means they have to hold lots of cash, which makes them target for robberies and so on. But um, and of course it would also mean uh, you know the central bank wouldn't really want to run this because they don't want to deal with help desks and customer service calls and all this sort of thing but you know you could imagine somebody that's already got those help desks you know big retailers or telecoms providers or somebody stepping in to do that the reason for thinking about this even though i don't think it's the best solution the reason for thinking about it is it's the cheapest solution i mean you just build 
a big robust database you put it in the middle and then the value transfers i mean they're just database entries it costs nothing the marginal costs of a transaction are absolutely negligible so the reason for thinking about this is because it's the cheapest way of doing it i really don't think it's the best way of doing it the second option would be go to go back to the Mondex idea and use tamper resistant hardware um the tamper resistant hardware nowadays people already have in those days you had to issue smart cards to people you had to issue them with chip cards because they didn't have the tamper resistant hardware but of course now everybody has you know in my in my iphone there's a secure enclave in android phones there's a secure element and okay you know there's arguments about who isn't in that allowed to use them and blah 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 but conceptually we could solve the problem for four-fifths of the population just by using the secure elements they already have in their mobile phones and if you could move money from one secure element to another secure element without having to go through a central database or a central switch that would be a very robust solution and i think having a solution like that which is utterly separate from the existing network infrastructure is a is a good thing to do there are ecological arguments for doing this it's a richer it's a more diverse ecosystem it's more able to withstand shocks if the bank network goes down this network stays up if the telecoms network goes down this network stays up so there's always a way to pay for things there's always a way to transfer money between people so this is a you know this is uh you know this could be a pretty good solution right i mean i think i think using secure elements to to deliver really you know because you do basically what you use the secure elements for is storing the private keys for the wallets um th this could deliver a really secure infrastructure for people i think you know it's worth thinking about the third option fed coin or fed token this is the thing i'm really interested in because what i think is and I said this in my previous book, if we develop networks which are used for trading digital assets, so it's so in a money-like behavior. So what I mean by that is if I send you, you know, some shares in Apple, uh, there's all sorts of intermediaries and brokers and contracts and payment versus delivery and blah, blah, blah. But if I send you some Apple money, it just goes from my wallet to your wallet. So what I mean by tokenized is I mean assets that have no clearing and settlement. They, they have money-like behavior. So if you had a generalized digital asset trading infrastructure, currencies would just be one kind of asset on that infrastructure. And central bank digital currencies would just be one kind of currency on the currency infrastructure. So if you think about this, like from a kind of computer science perspective, you know, you build a generalized digital asset trading infrastructure. One kind of asset is currencies and the central bank is just one kind of currency. So you have electronic money institutions, private institutions, which can issue those currencies. You have, you know, some new categories of, of institutions that are allowed to issue stock, essentially. I don't want to get into that for this presentation, but um, but you see what I'm driving at there. So instead of treating central bank digital currencies like a special thing, we just treat it as one of a number of different kinds of currency. And I think it would exhibit some very valuable characteristics in this space. So that's good. So how do we go about creating? So if I'm right about that, how do we go about creating a central bank digital currency? Let's talk about architecture. So this is the Bank of England's proposals from March 2020 that they set out in their discussion paper, which is not bad. So the Bank of England say, basically, let's kind of do what the what the Chinese do. We have a two tier solution. So the bank doesn't issue electronic cash directly to people. You have what the bank call payment interface providers and payment interface providers could be. I mean, you know, banks would automatically qualify under european law you would also have payment institutions that could do this and you might introduce other special regulatory categories but i i wouldn't think so i think payment institution regulation is adequate for this so we have payment institutions and banks that deal with the users 
And those payment institutions and banks have um, authorized API access through to uh, what the Bank of England calls the central bank core ledger. And this could be a database. Um, it could be some sort of distributed database. But I think there is an interesting argument here for saying, because of because of reasons to do with with resiliency and transparency, not because of any kind of you know cryptocurrency reasons, but there might be some good reasons for making that some form of decentralized. Um, I prefer the term shared ledger because obviously distributed is a, is a is an architectural description. So let's say we might have some sort of shared ledger at the beginning where perhaps. Um, the uh, the formation of distributed consensus is done by the licensed payment interface providers. Now, obviously, you don't need a blockchain for that because the purpose of having a blockchain is to form consensus in the presence of untrusted third parties. If the Bank of England allows untrusted third parties to become payment interface providers, then they have a lot more to worry about than forming consensus. So in this example, there'd be no reason to have a blockchain um, but, a, but, a, but a shared ledger could still be a good solution. So let's take this a little bit further forward and just think like conceptually, how would this actually work then? So here's my diagram of, of how I think this would work. So I imagine that we use the, the shared ledger layer, what you might think of as the cryptocurrency layer, just purely as the value transfer layer. So we have a secure value transfer layer which means nothing. The values on that don't mean anything. Uh, they're just numbers. And then we have two separate cryptographic bindings to one bind the values to uh, some form of asset. And that asset might be currency. It might be stocks and shares. It might be uh, a square inch of the Mona Lisa. It might be all sorts of things. There might be many different things we bind to. I've used the example here of Libra. So in this example, uh, we have a binding between the values on the ledger and the Libra basket of currencies. And that that binding is maintained by Libra. So if I, you know, if Dave Birch says 10011111 is 10 Libras, who cares? You don't care. But if if the Libra consortium says 101010 is, you know, 10 units of the Libra currency or whatever, then that's fine. But that could be any kind of any kind of asset. So so we have the we have the value. And we bind it to something in the real world, and that then becomes the crypto asset. Then we have a second binding, which binds the wallets where those values are stored to entities in the real world. So in the example I've got here, this is this is Novi, this is Facebook. Um, and so by, by binding those two identities in the real world, we now have a market. If we just have the assets, but we don't know who anybody is, then we end up with with uh, you know the DeFi scam Wild West you know nonsense. You, you you can't have a functioning market unless there's a binding to identities in the real world. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the parties to a transaction know who all the counterparties are. In the Chinese digital currency, they have what's you know they have second party anonymity. So you can send money to somebody and you don't know who they are. Um, but the central bank knows who they are, or at least one of the one of the banks in the network knows who they are. So we have these two separate bindings. We have we have the we have the asset binding that's done through one set of, and then we have the identity binding that's done through another set of organisations. And those two things together give us a functioning market on top of that. So now you can see where my thinking is coming from. In this binding, uh, in this uh, model, the central bank is just another crypto asset. And it provides the binding between the, the tokens that we're transferring around and the, uh, the uh, central bank assets, the risk-free central bank assets. So the Bank of England would, be, would provide a binding between tokens to pound sterling. The Federal Reserve would provide a binding to dollars. The European Central Bank would provide a binding to euros so you might ask why don't we just use why don't we just use companies to do that why don't we just why doesn't Citibank provide that binding well because you know city i mean Citibank certainly will want to provide bindings to other kinds of assets but i don't want my token bound to 
claims on a private bank, a commercial bank. I want the risk-free claim to the central bank for, for this, for the currency. There's all sorts of other things I will buy into the bank, but not the currency. So uh, in conclusion, here's my little tree of evolution. So uh, we start off with atoms uh, and then we move on to atoms about atoms when we invent printing. And that's in China, of course. Um, and then we begin to move on to bits about atoms with the telegraph. And then this becomes bits about bits after 1971 when uh, Nixon takes America off of the gold standard. And then we start, then we enter the world of credit money and we use networks to move credit around. And then we move into the era of cryptography. And what we use cryptography for is to build token infrastructure, digital assets. And I think the best way to think about central bank digital currency is not as a thing in its own right, but just as one particular example of tokens that are traded on a more efficient infrastructure that has no clearing and no settlement. So that's my that's my crazy theory about uh, how central bank digital currency should work. And I think we still have a couple of minutes left. So if I stop sharing the screen, I'm very happy to take uh, any questions that come in, Bogdan. David, that was very impressive, really. Honestly, I was like, uh... First of all, I read your book Beyond uh, Beyond Babylon uh, before Babylon Beyond Bitcoin. It was like thank you. I That's very kind. Yeah, and I'm uh, you know I'm really feeling um, uh, it. It's it's really it feels awesome just to talk to you right now as well. And this <laughs> book this book it allowed me to um, to get to the threshold where I can actually describe to people why I need Bitcoin. That was the that was the the, the point to which I arrived after reading the books specifically. So why do you need such mechanism? And that's You're very, very kind. Also, I really like the, um, your idea. It's not like it's not you, but it's uh, the perspective from which you derive it. So that the tokenization is basically about binding and that's it. It's just the mechanism of binding, you know, token and uh, currency and uh, per ID and the person, that's it. So that's what tokenization is about. So yeah. Oh, I, you know, I, look, there are, there are lots of people that think that tokenization is the way forward. I, I'm not the only person who thinks that this is the right way forward, but I think it's very helpful to think of it in a more structured way so that people understand yeah. the different roles and the different parts of the value network where they can participate. Yes. So you just know the scope of appliance really. Yeah. Uh, I would, it, you know, we do not have any time because we need to switch to another uh, speaker. But uh, no problem. Really, Who is the next speaker? Or you know, just to just to ask a lot of questions. I'm really interested to hear your opinion on decentralized PKI as well, and uh, a lot of things. Honestly, I would be glad to be, you know to to, to yeah, talk no, to you next time. Email. I don't know. However, well, only, right uh, now yeah. I'm going to relax and enjoy the next presentation. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much, David.